cleanse you, but you still want the magazine, buy it on the newsstand a few times, or borrow it for a friend, or photocopy it in the library. But make them feel it economically, because economics is all we understand right now. It's too bad, but it really works. So, yeah. Um, I think I do a lot with college population, and a lot of what you're talking about with women getting this diet of fluff starts in high school and in college. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be reading this. Um, that's just not their type of magazine. Mm -hmm. Are there any movements in advertising right now with maybe women who are running these um, advertising agencies to have different kinds of advertisements for high school and college women that show real women, you know, five foot five, 140 pounds, whatever, real women in the advertisements. Is there any kind of movement for that? Not in advertising. In fact, Frances Lear just met enormous resistance from advertisers because their belief is that women's contempt is so complete by the time they're 40 that even women don't want to look at pictures of themselves. You know, so we don't even get images of what we really look like at 40. Not in advertising. Um, there have been subtle and slow changes in advertising. You know, the no comment section in Ms. did shame several companies out of terribly sexist ads. But in terms of image, no. Be partly because there is a proliferation of these products now. Um, you know, if you're not doing something about your skin, you're really regarded as slovenly, which is, you know, just absurd. But when you walk into the cosmetics department, look, I mean, it's a $30 billion industry for dieting. It's more than that for cosmetics. We're talking about a powerful economic force here. So what we're saying is if women in this culture regained their self-esteem, it could collapse the economy. A lot of jobs would be lost, possibly more than the military. <laughs> I mean, changing to a PC economy, moving from a self-loathing um, you know, and what I, I keep thinking about all the other things that could be done with this money. I attended a conference in um, Atlanta, Georgia last year to cover a story for Ms. on women in economic development. And I remember that Jetta Jones, this comedian, had said that she went into a California diet spa to find out how much it would cost her to lose. 35 pounds, and she was given an estimated total of $35,000. And she said, shit, for $35,000 I could hire somebody else to go out and be me, <laughs> provide a job, you know. <clears throat> $35,000. So it's big money. I really think it has to begin almost someplace else, almost outside of that industry. I almost think that it, you know, and, and there are certainly signs that, that uh, a resistance is being formed. There have been, there's been constant um, consciousness raising about this issue for the last 15 years. We make very, very slow inroads on that. Everybody likes to say, this is from my speech tonight, that change takes time. But change doesn't take time. Women have changed. We are ready to change. Resistance takes time. And resistance takes an enormous amount of time. And there are billions of dollars behind that resistance. I mean, here's another thing that I th will probably cover tonight, is if you think about the whole ERA battle, many of you may not have been reading a lot of the daily coverage of it in the newspapers then, but the big, that was really about economics too. It was really about changing women's status in this society. But Phil Schlafly and the Eagle Forum, funded by multinational corporations, managed to keep the debate focused on unisex toilets and the fear of drafting women. Well, it is now 12 years later. We don't have equal pay. We do have unisex toilets, and we do have women in the military. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> so, you know, it's not that we haven't been talking about these things. It's not that the, the issues aren't out there. And, you know, there are, are writers like Naomi Wolf and, and the beauty myth who really clearly indicate what the extent 
of the issues are. But, you know, each generation, I think, changes a bit, but we are up against powerful economic forces right now. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. question, why it takes so long. Um, well, part of it is the FDA does set up some of the best safety measures and safety standards um, for approving new drugs and medications. First, they have to get protocols for testing. They have to you know, register new drugs. They have to be tested in clinical trials. It takes years to collect this data. On contraception devices, the AIDS crisis will undoubtedly move that more swiftly along because it's been very interesting what has happened in the gay community. This was another, I know a lot about this because I spent um, a year in the um, ACT UP underground. Um, they have what are known as buyers clubs and guerrilla clinics and they have a treatment and data committee that publishes an underground newsletter. The, the buyers clubs evolved because when it was taking so long for drugs like AZT and DDI and DDC to wind their way through the system, um, we were being able, the, the gay community organized to bootleg these drugs from other countries where they were being sold. And they were legitimately for, for sale with prescription, but you could get them. So they were being bootlegged into this country and they were being sold for cost through the buyer's clubs. Well, in order to monitor the patients who were self-diagnosing, self-medicating, we needed clinics to take care of them. So the, all these clinics sprung up, um, which the Hastings Clinic called guerrilla clinics because they um, were not working with the FDA and they were not working in the clinical trials. But this became important to do because the only, if you have a disease like AIDS, which is life-threatening and the time is running out, and these are possibly life-extending drugs. They're not cures for AIDS, but they have had, um, the, the prophylaxis therapies that we have now has had a remarkable effect for prolonging lives. Well, each year you can stay alive leads you closer. It, first of all, it improves the quality of your life, but also it's very possible that, um, you know, the longer you can live, the closer we get to uh, a cure. So it was very important. Well, the, to, the only way to get these drugs was to register in a clinical trial. And you could only get into the clinical trials if you met the protocols. And in order to purify the test results, they eliminated all of the variables from the norm, which were drug addicts, all minorities, women and children, which left you with a norm of a fairly healthy white male who was HIV positive. So it meant all of those other populations had no access to drugs. That's why the guerrilla clinics sprung up. The buyers, and the other thing that's so interesting about this to me was these people were doing this illegally, knowing that it was illegal. They felt that it was very important to do because people would die otherwise, and so they had a strong motivation for doing it. But the gay community, which was already an oppressed group, knew and understood how to organize. So within their own community, they had pharmacists, doctors, statisticians. They had desktop publishers to get information out. They had the fax machines. They had, they had everything within their own community that they needed. They also had phenomenal fundraising abilities because you have many households with two male incomes in them. That's a, a, a well-financed household. All of these things combined together to make this a very powerful 
force. At the same time, hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans were losing their health insurance and all access to medical care here in our own communities. This, this underground exists now in every single major city in the United States. There are buyer's clubs, there are guerrilla clinics, and you can have access to the TND um, bulletins on what's new, what's next. No lawsuits in seven years. And obviously there have been some bizarre and extreme experiments. There have been deaths. And this is a very litigious population still no malpractice suits against either a buyer's club or a guerrilla clinic, partly because it's nonprofit. Nobody's making money off of this. They're only doing it as a service. And partly because nobody wants it shut down. So the FDA is very aware of this. And last year, because they couldn't shut this down and because it meant that they were losing part of their population in the clinical trials, because of the protocols. If you were on one kind of drug that you thought was helping you and you wanted to get this other one, you had to stop taking this one and take that one. And it was to purify, again, the results of the science, but it didn't particularly care about the life of the patient. So people were lying in the clinical studies. They were saying, no, I'm not using that drug, and they were. Or all of the um, placebos were exposed because they would go in for DDC and if they found out that they were taking a placebo and how did they find out? They just went to the underground lab and said, test this for me. If it's a placebo, I'm dropping out of the study. So they did. So in order for the FDA and drug companies to continue the validity of their tests, the underground literally had to be legalized. And when that underground was legalized, it changed everything for the rest of us as well. What came into um, reality last year was compassionate use drugs, so that if someone needs a drug that the FDA hasn't approved and it is legal anyplace else in the world, you can now legally import it um, and you won't be prosecuted. They developed laws for the parallel track so that if a community doctor said, my patients can't get into your clinical trial, so you have to supply me with the drug so that I can administer to these patients, the parallel track was legalized. Well, that will make a big difference for women with breast cancer. If we can also organize and use these medical changes that have been made. So that is a much longer answer to your question than you wanted, I'm sure. <laughs> Any other questions about journalism or anything? Yeah. Oh. It's a very interesting place. I love teaching there. It, um, it's a large undergraduate as well as a huge graduate school and has lots and lots of components. It has the Parsons School of Design. It has a law school. It has a graduate school. But it actually started with three um, professors from Yale who were feeling that they did not have adequate academic freedom in the 1930s. And then when um, the Nazi threat became very, very apparent in Germany and in Europe, they actively re re recruited many of the Jewish intellectuals throughout Europe and many of the Jewish scholars and invited them here to help start the school. So it's been in existence since the um, mid-1930s and it still has a strong commitment to um, serve as a community forum. It's one of the largest adult education programs in Manhattan because it uses the city resources, its filmmakers, its artists, its writers, um, and its other professionals. And uh, the classes that I've taught there have just been absolutely fascinating. You know, I'll find out that most of my students have produced Broadway plays. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what am I doing up here? <laughs> but you know, they come because, you know, they're always interested in uh, a new genre or interested in um, expanding 
what they're doing. So a lot of a lot of it's got a huge adult education program, and most of the people in it are professionals. Um, so it's an interesting place. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you.